Hello and welcome everybody to Taco Movie Talks. This is week 12 and I am brought to you here with War Champ, aka Matthew. And I am very, very excited to have you on today, Matthew, because we have a pretty sick theme for that week. And would you like to tell the fans what the theme for this episode is, Matthew? So the theme is, uh, well, D- Dogma 95. We're going to talk, be talking about two Dogma 95 films. And those are films which uh, Taco said he's going to put up on the screen. Um, have like these rules behind them uh, that say, you know, it basically, I'm not going to say every rule, but it like strips filmmaking down to like its core elements to where there's like no score, there's no editing. It's just kind of like you film and it kind of makes it look like a home movie is the best way to describe it. All the dog films kind of look like they could be, you know, at home films. Exactly. And uh, the two films that we're going to be discussing is Julian Donkey Boy by Harmony Corinne and The Celebration by Thomas Vinterberg. And they are definitely kind of two different looks at how dogma can really influence the film and and what you can create within this role set. And to your mind, Matthew, when, when you hear about these kind of what some people would consider maybe insane rules or tedious or hard to abide by, uh, do you feel like it is beneficial for directors or do you think that it can also have its drawbacks as well well i mean of course it can have its drawbacks um you know if you're trying to make something with a big budget i don't see why you would do this if -hmm. you have that budget but um then again like i really see all the pros like i love all the pros to it in my opinion when you strip down or when you strip away like people's access to things like this goes for like any creative art form like music um is another good example so like if you were just to put someone in like a room with just a an old uh in music like an old sampler like um like they used to do in hip-hop um they were still making in my opinion you know just as good of beats back then as they could make now and they were doing it with a lot of stripped down hardware and now you have all these different sounds you can choose when you're on your uh you know ableton live or whatever logic pro x to make all these different sounds there's like billions of different options and it's the same i think with filmmaking nowadays there's billions of different options when it comes to editing and like post-production and sound and like how you shoot it and the lens of the camera and all this stuff and so when you make everything super simple and you're like let's make these rules to where you know, we can only use like 35 millimeter film. We can only use handheld cameras. Everything has to be like, like basically every mistake is is going to be part of the movie. I mean, you can cut out the mistake or like actual like acting mistakes, but like a lot of it is is going to be improvisation because you don't have that security that you had a lot of the time before with all the different editing th- uh, techniques you could do to make things go away. Like, um, I even, and, and one of the ones we're not discussing, and the idiots, another dog movie, like, there's even, like, two scenes where you can see the sound guy in the background. <laughs> like, they just, you know, they mess up, and they're just kind of like, screw it, because they want to fall, they're trying to follow the rules, and I think it actually makes them more creative, um, at least in, in these two films. Especially, Especially for the celebration, more so, um, because they're because of the lack of the uh, of what they have available. I agree. It, it certainly lends itself to because, as weird as it sounds, it's like kind of forcing yourself to abide by this. I think you have to get creative in order to make something that is still effective, and I, I think today honestly if this were to kind of 
come back around today because it, it really kind of flies in the face of modern filmmaking. I don't know if I would be surprised by that at all. I mean, what do you think, Matt? Yeah, I, I was actually thinking that last night. I was thinking, you know, if there was another Dog 95 type movement that went on today, I think it would actually gain a lot of traction just because of how much of the same we've been kind of getting mm-hmm. in terms of in terms of movies. I mean, it's not like these were probably came out in like, you know, Cinemark or anything. I, I doubt maybe the celebration, but I mean, I doubt these really played much in like as a block in terms of like a blockbuster. But mm-hmm. I think like for movie fans, I think a lot of people are just um, getting tired of, of having the same big movies come out and something like this. I mean, this was like kind of pretty much pre big internet. I mean, the internet existed in the late nineties, but like, Eh, you know, only some people were using it. I think now this could really create like some sort of, you know, social media movement and stuff like that. It's where a bunch of people are creating these types of movies. I, I definitely do think the prevalence of the internet would really grab a hold of people because I've heard of dogma for years and watching these two movies with you is actually the first time that I watched a dogma film, but it's always had this mystique to it. And it was always kind of interesting to me that people would, would do something like this. And I, it was like, I, I wondered their motivations. And I think now I somewhat can see that they were really trying to I mean, I think the the point of it was to take the power away from um, producers, I believe. In doing uh, that's definitely part of it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because the thing is, like, um, you know, when they take their scripts, and especially especially goes for Har- like Harmony scripts, he doesn't really have much script, and so like when you try and present that kind of stuff to producers they're usually not going to like it because they want to be able to make money you know, mm. off the movie. Yeah. <laughs> so when they see that it's this weird, artsy, like, home footage-looking film, they're probably not going to give you, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're going to be like, this will not sell. I'm not going to fund this, you know? So, yeah, uh, I would agree with that, yeah. And, and I mean, I don't know how... Um, kind of, th- I don't know if theoretical is the right word to describe it, but so much like movies are looked at as investments today. And it, I don't know, maybe that's the right way to look at it. But, you know, whenever you, you see these kind of masterpieces of, of film, you, it's an art form. You know, so it's it's kind of weird that there's it's being pushed into, you know, the consumer market so hard where it's like you said, you know, everything has to look super clean. You know, we we need to get Scarlett Johansson in this movie. People are going to show up to see her and we need a love interest because, you know, people want to have a little bit of romance. And it's like you kind of lose what can actually make a film great by doing that. I I agree. I I mean, I agree. Like, like I, for example, like I grew up playing uncharted. I freaking love those games. I did not Mm -hmm. see the movie because, because I love the game so much. So where I understand that it didn't make the casting didn't make sense. Like the casting Mm -hmm. seemed to be like just for profit. Like it was all just Mm -hmm. for profit, you know, very, you know, and, and even back then, you know, they were churning out nors, you know, Hollywood was for, and they were profiting from them. But now it's like they're, I think they're more, they're doing a lot more like uh, sequels, reboots of older intellectual properties to try and catch grab. And I think it's pretty obvious that they're doing that. And so I think like something new and like, you're right. It's like film is also very much an art form and I like it in that way more than, than it just being a, an investable, like profitable product, mm-hmm. which is what it turns out to be a lot of the times. 
but you know but when it comes to what films will be remembered like years along the line if they're still if, we, if people still have access to them 100 200 years from now it's going to be the great films you know it's going to be like the the art ones the ones that that say something about you know the culture that they're coming from or mm. the people you know that are making them or just like the society that the people are living, you know or something you know yeah uh it's like because some of these these films almost kind of transcend their time period where watching them now like the movies we watched with you know for the bergman episode have uh -huh. they just kind of changed my perspective on stuff and it stuck with me it's like a movie that i didn't just forget like that and a lot of a lot of stuff is just kind of you know it's window dressing it's it's kind of I don't not flat, you know, but it's like it's like a flashy sign that you pass while you're driving through a city. It's like, you know, as you see it, it catches your attention, but it, it's out of your mind as soon as you leave the theater. Yeah, it's the I I call it the spectacle, you mm. know, uh, the the giant spectacle. You know, it's kind of like um, it's cool when you're there looking at it, but then it just leaves your mind kind of when you go away. But Movies, or I'm sorry, scenes from the both of these movies, like I can remember vividly, like yes. tons of both from both. They just stick with you, like it doesn't leave your mind. It's not that same, like it's a spectacle, but in a different way. It's not just there to be like, I don't know, as you were saying, like, like it's it's not like that other thing, obviously, but it's spectacle in the way that it like kind of makes you go whoa, you mm -hmm. know, but it's different. Yeah, so I think uh, I, I I watched a, a follow up interview with Harmony Corinne, and I think you had sent me one, Matthew, and that inspired me to to just watch another short one by him. But it was like his advice for new directors. He's like, don't say the same thing. Say something. Say it loudly, but like essentially be different you know uh because there's so much just almost kind of like factory generated movies and we were talking a little bit before we started recording but as far as harmony goes and and this is the first movie i've watched by him but he it's that spectacle it's just kind of like you are literally you're seeing something filmed differently you're getting these characters that are so uh unique and weird and these scenes that you just you don't normally get and i feel like it was able to completely hold my attention because one i'm trying to figure out what the hell's going on and two it's <laughs> like this plot these characters it's so compelling because it's just so different yeah um <laughs> like I'll just go ahead and say it like Gummo's my I consider that my favorite film of all time because that was the movie that was like my first movie I saw back in high school well, I want to say like sophomore year junior year a long long time ago now um and I was just I remember I was upstairs in my in my game room and I was just like uh, I've always I forgot how I found the movie but I watched it and it was the first movie I watched that wasn't like any other because i had only ever gone to the movies just like with my friends or my family just to see you know the new big movie or whatever mm -hmm. and now i was watching this and i was like what do you basically what you just said what the hell is going on <laughs> like why are the like this doesn't seem like a movie to me and then that's when i first started getting it like getting into film and realizing it was way more than just because i remember I, I would i used to do these searches and i like w would not go before the year like 2005 or 2010 i only wanted new movies and i thought that you know all old, old movies sucked and all this stuff but um after watching that i was like no like that it just expanded you know kind of everything mm -hmm. for me that was the start and then julian donkey boy is kind of just like a kind of a, it's, it's a similar type of movie um but it's it does he does the same kind of things there and and harmony himself i know 
a lot about him. I've seen um, uh, pro- probably every interview I could with him. And I know you love uh, Werner Herzog. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember, I think before he was going to make Gummo, so Werner started becoming pretty involved and in helping him get pro- producers and stuff. And he, he tells this story that Werner called him and said, when he was going to do the Dogma film, he's like, Werner said, like, you were the last, like, uh, man in the army or something like that. Like, like some kind of funny <laughs> reference about, like, uh, film directors that were still, <laughs> still, still, like, like, holding down the, I, I don't know, some funny, like, w- like, weird war reference he used about uh, directors who were basically still trying to make art and weren't mm-hmm. trying to turn out, like, uh, profitable blockbusters. <laughs> Werner absolutely cracks me up so much. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, like, and in, in his, like, deadpan delivery of a lot of stuff is absolutely hilarious. And, and I thought he was super duper funny in Julian Donkey Boy. I don't know if you, if you thought that as well. I completely agree. He was like, like almost every scene I remember is he's in it. <laughs> 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 like his accent, you know, it doesn't, like he's kind of just being himself, but mm-hmm. I mean, you don't know him. We don't. We don't know him personally, obviously. But it seems like he's being so. He's got his accent, you know. He's just kind of acting like an <laughs> like, <laughs> like a mean version, I guess, of himself, you know. Um, but yeah, he to me is like essential to this movie. And it's uh, yeah, it's so neat that you kind of brought up Gummo being your introduction or you know like sparked your interest and got you super duper interested in film because Werner actually kind of did that for me after I watched uh Aguirre the wrath of god and it was yeah. just like this is so different and it led me I was like I I, I couldn't get enough cinema after that where i was like i want to try different stuff because it just it hit me different and now here we are watching dogma movies in 2022 and i'm actually quite enjoying them you know yeah no that warner Werner can do the exact same thing as harmony i think like i've seen um i i, I don't know if you've seen even dwarf started small yet not yet. That's a no. crazy. That's a crazy one from him. Um, <laughs> that's a really weird one from him. But he, like, I haven't seen. I know you've seen. I think you've seen a lot more than me. Like, I haven't seen Strozek. I think how you say it, and mm. some of his other uh, more pop famous ones. I have seen Aguirre the Wrath of God, and like, I've seen a few of his documentaries. And yeah, he is very. He is a very different filmmaker as well. That that would easily, if I would have seen one of his films, I probably would have been like you know what is especially with that uh that one actor that he has in ior and a few of his movies that uh, is it kinski yeah that's uh <laughs> there's a whole movie i watched basically about Werner and him made by Werner. Uh, my best friend best friend yeah yeah <laughs> and then you get to know just how kind of crazy that guy was <laughs> oh and man how that kind of added that effect i think to all the movies he was in with Werner. Yeah, honestly, knowing that behind the scenes stuff was that was like, oh, I have to watch more movies by them now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just to know, like, oh, probably before this take, like, the guy who's on screen was probably just absolutely losing his shit for like <laughs> 10 straight minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then the whole thing about, I haven't actually seen Fitz Carl Lotto. Mm. <laughs> I don't remember how to pronounce it. Um, I haven't actually seen that one yet. I really want to. Like that's one I've always been intending to watch. That one in Strozek. Um, but I know that in my best friend, I remember they say that those uh, made, actual Native Americans almost killed him. <laughs> I mean, I, I know we're getting a little off topic here, but yeah. But I thought that was, you know, stuff like just little interesting things like that that you hear in behind the scenes and in interviews and in that movie. In this case, um, you know that his character. And him, I guess, just being who he was or who he is, I'm not sure if he's still alive, was really added to the chaos of the set, which I think is something um, that actually is really relevant to dogma movies because there's a lot of chaos on these sets. 
from what I've, yeah, I've done a lot of reading and just like interviews with them about these different films. And, you know, you, when you have a, not a lot to work with, you got to provoke the actors a lot of the time, not mm. immorally. They try not to do it immorally, you know, but in a, in a moral way, <laughs> if, you know what if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, which is, and this is, you know, kind of somewhat related because, you know, Lars von Trier and Thomas Vinterberg were the creators of Dogma. And I believe, and maybe correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, as I'm just going based off of, you know, what I've seen and I could remember incorrectly, but uh, Lars von Trier and I, were, was Bjork Dancer in the Dark together? Mm-hmm. Uh, was, yeah, well, that was a movie he made. Yeah, I've seen that. And that, I don't believe that's Dogma, but didn't Mm-mm. he like really provoke? There was like kind of a large controversy yeah. about the way he treated Bjork. Well, yeah. So I'll just do like a brief little thing about what I know about Lars. Um, yeah. So she came out later on and said, um, the film I, or, on a movie set a director i don't know if harassed me or basically like made me feel you know bad or you know basically it was just acting like mean to her Mm -hmm. the whole movie i'm not sure exactly what it was and that was the only movie she was in at the time (laughs) so it was kind of obvious who she was talking about and then i've heard a lot of bad things about lars um uh nicholas redfin the guy that made drive um Mm. Apparently, they have a bad relationship because Lars has tried to do things with his wife, supposedly. Oh. Um, and if you watch Lars's Dogma 95 film and you realize that it's all real and happening and you'll realize that Lars von Trier isn't really a great person, <laughs> but he <laughs> makes good movies. Um, because I know that's not one of our movies that we're talking about, but... The movie's literally, he makes like a group of actors act mentally challenged or out and go around outside to the public and do it. And like, and he provokes his actors in, the, in an immoral way. I'll just put it that way. He does mm-hmm. think, and you can, and he films it like he films them getting upset and he puts it in the movie. It's like he's, he just seems like it's coming from a dark place compared to Vinterberg and, and Harmony, um, he seems a little more I don't know like <laughs> untrustworthy yeah <laughs> um, yeah, he's one of, maybe one of those directors I would be more hesitant to, to want to work with, I'm not sure yeah. makes good movies though <laughs> that's true and I mean do you think there's any do you think there has to be <sighs> I'm trying to think of the best way to word this, but pain, like th- these maybe negative life experiences or, you know, like it's like the, the tortured artist, you know, kind of stereotype. Like, do you think that is necessary to be able to create works of art that kind of transcend and people are able to like really truly resonate with, or do you think it's kind of, it's not actually necessary. Um, well, I think the best way to exemplify that would just to be to compare Harmony and Lars. And I think that, I mean, they make different movies, but like, and the way that I said Lars, like a morally provoked his actors, like there's, there's a scene where in that movie in the idiots where like, and I think this is real because it looks very real. Like uh, one of their dads like comes and gets the girl on set. And I think she had like actual like, men- like she was having actual like emotional mental problems like on the set because mm. they had literally just I don't want to. You know, I'm just going to go ahead and spoil it. There, there's a there's an orgy that happens in the movie and it's real. And right okay. after that happens, she <laughs> The dad, it's just weird. Like the whole thing is weird. Um, and and then you got like Harmony on on the other hand, and he provokes his actors in the, 
but I think he does it in a in a more moral way because he love from what just from what I've seen from him, he loves his characters, you know, mm-hmm. and he thinks they're all perfect. Um, and he doesn't, so he doesn't want to make them. He's not going to make them do stuff they don't want to do ever. He just is always trying to get them usually to be themselves because he likes to cast people um, that that are very similar to the character he wants to see on screen. You know, one of the things I really like about his movies and about the Dogma movies in general is that you're watching them and you're like, or at least for me, you know, if you don't know it's zombie, you're like, is this real? Or is mm. this, a, you know? And I love that feeling. I absolutely love, like, wondering that during a movie and then, like, doing a little research after and figuring out, you know, well, was this real or not, um, you know? So, uh, but in terms of provocation, I think, you know, I'm not, a, I have never done it myself since I've never directed, but, um, but I think the, the way I've, I've heard Harvey describe how he provokes actors is a more, you know, he, he just likes to, to build up tension on the set, you know, like in, without the cameras rolling and then just kind of have an explosion happen and film that. And mm-hmm. I think that, that, you know, um, I think that really, that leads to a lot of uh, uh, good scenes. Matthew, would you want to describe uh, Julian Donkey Boy? Yeah, so um, it's a movie. So Harmony's um, uncle is schizophrenic, and so he wanted to make a movie about a schizophrenic, and he hated how... um, and I agree, and I agree with him on this because all the movies I've seen with schizophrenics, they're just kind of like they're not really shown like how schizophrenic people actually are. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to kind of show like the the real version of what a schizophrenic is, not like the cute movie version, not like the little quippy, you know schizophrenic character character cartoon character whatever he wanted to show like the what what it actually is like and so i think the best way to describe the movie is what life is like for um someone with schizo with with like some pretty harsh schizophrenia uh living in i'd say the south um uh, in in america of course um because his movies are all very american and um yeah, that's that'd be the best way to describe it. Um, just kind of about his schizophrenia and kind of about life for those types of or for people with those conditions and um, for people that are living with people with those mm-hmm. conditions. Um, you know, because a lot of what he got it from was him watching how his uncle, you know, treated his family members. Yeah, and I'm glad you you, you threw that in because it it really does give a really a uh, powerful portrayal of like how this affects the entire family and kind of how flawed everyone in the family is as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I can get more into the, how flawed they are. Um, <laughs> if you want me to. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, am I correct in this or did I misinterpret things? Um, but did Chloe Sevigny's character was she impregnated by Julian? Yep. Okay. Because they, <laughs> yeah. you know, I wasn't sure if I like misread that scene because there she's uh, getting an ultrasound, I think, and mm-hmm. they ask like, "Where is the father? Is the father in the picture?" And then it like kind of cuts to uh, like photos of chloe sevigny and like julian together and i didn't pick up until like a little bit later that they were brother and sister and i was like oh shit yeah (laughs) this yeah this is way it goes way deeper than just you know what you saw prior to that yeah it's um yeah that's that's it's pretty messed up but um but like Harmony has said that he wants that he likes to like explore all taboos and he thinks all taboos should be um, put on the screen because he doesn't think there is anything that shouldn't be filmed. 
Um, but in that same light, you know, um, I, I just think, you know, the whole incest part, I, I don't think it was a, cause like you said, you barely even picked up on it. I only know mm -hmm. of it because I, I know a lot about this movie. Um, but that was, I just, I just think, you know, that does happen, you know, mm -hmm. it's not often, but uh, you know, and I mean, it does happen, but I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I want to talk much more about it, but I will say that Harvey does. I, I, as I've said, I've seen like all his interviews. He, he likes, likes movies with incest in it. I'm just going to say that <laughs> like La Luna is a movie with it. A uh, murmur of the heart, which is actually a movie I love. Um, so he likes that taboo and he likes provoking the audience too, is something I'd say also, like he wants you to kind of be shocked. Um, I don't think he ever has that intention. He's like, I'm going to do this to make the viewer shocked. I just think that's how his mind works. And I think it just comes out shocking because that's how he thinks. Yeah. And, and I think as far as, uh, creativity, I think the really the only way to truly be creative is to push the bounds as far as I, I think if you if you're like oh this is off limits this is too taboo we really shouldn't explore this I think you can limit a lot of stuff in between without quite realizing it and you you can't truly show something new and also I think you you leave a lot of uh, territory unexplored if you're like look incest is just you you can't have that i'm not saying movies aren't as good because they all don't have incest scenes or whatever but <laughs> if you just are never going to go to certain places i don't know if if that limits you even more than you realize or not yeah um yeah no i know what you're saying and he's he's willing to you know explore any subject and that's that's you know what i find super interesting you know this whole even the the premise of it just being a movie about schizophrenia it's not even really a story to me mm. it's more moments of this guy's life and they seem real he really does seem he's a very good actor in this movie oh he's really tremendous but i thought he was at because harmony usually likes to cast like like real types of people except for the few main casts and i mean i thought you know he might be an actor because he was part of the main cast but i also thought he might actually be schizophrenic that's how how good his performance was in my opinion um but yeah he he pushes the limits in terms of like um writing up scripts and then i've heard that he'll come to the next day to the set and be like we aren't doing anything that's on the script throwing it all out we're doing something completely new today so he really just likes to to toss things up and just you know he i think you know i and i can't attest to all this this is just for me watching interviews like i said none of this is like personal i have not had any personal experience with it but it seems like he likes to just shake stuff up on set keep the camera rolling and then edit in the parts that or, or you know edit out all the boring stuff and keep in all the all those moments that he finds compelling yeah and i think this movie gave him a lot of freedom to where i mean you could have edited this to really go a few different you know, you could have told the story differently, I think, if you wanted to via editing. And um, it's because it, it's such it's so loosely structured, but I think it kind of works for what it's going through. By the way, you mentioned uh, Julian's acting and um, mm -hmm. I knew him from train spotting. And oh, he's yeah. in train spotting. Oh, that's he's right. He's in train spotting. Yeah. Yeah. Now. Okay. <laughs> he's I've seen that movie. It's just been a lot. It's just been a few years. Yeah. And okay. you know what he does? Because I think, you know, he looks different. And through the I don't even know if we mentioned yet, like the the graininess of the film, it makes it um 
really, really unique for sure. So yeah, yeah, this one's like I if I I don't know much about like film physical film, mm-hmm. but I had heard I had I I recall either reading or hearing that he didn't just like record it on the little DV. D cameras like they usually do for dogma he like did that or he recorded it on eight millimeter and then he like converted the film to like 16 or something and then he blew it up to 35 he did something crazy to make it to give it that weird look that honestly no other movie even his really has Mm -hmm. it's like like when they're inside like the carpet just looks like like there's no texture to it. You know what I mean? Like uh, everything's like I don't know how to describe it. You just have to see it. It's like everything's like it, it it's like they brought it back to those home video cameras, but it's like even more home videoed. I don't know how else to how else to describe it. No, I completely agree. Like it yeah, it feels like early nineties home video. And then um there's also times where I think it's a, you know they are shooting the television that's also playing a, a home video, I believe, of Chloe's character figure skating. Or it might have just been yes. like a famous figure skater. It looks insane. You, like you could literally yes. – the pixels are like the size of your thumb on the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I remember. I know exactly what part you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and uh, – Another interesting, and I think I can't remember if he's watching the uh, screen. So there's a couple of scenes where they visit, and you can tell it's an actual um, mental institute mm. that they're at. Do you know what I'm talking about when yeah. they visit those people? And then um, one of my favorite characters is the guy that can play cards with his feet. And that, I mean, I, this is totally just, I mean, it doesn't relate to the story at all, but Harmony just included it. I know because he just thought this was, this guy was just cool. You know, <laughs> he just thinks this stuff, he's like, like for example, short, short story, like he met David, Bl- David Blaine, the magician in the nineties mm-hmm. and he didn't care about magic, but David Blaine pulled his socks out of, uh, supposedly pulled his socks off of him with his shoes still on and the shoes never came off and he said after that he loved david blaine so he just <laughs> likes people that can like do magic kind of things you know what i mean and this guy can play cards with his feet you know that's crazy mm-hmm. <laughs> um so there's just little things like that in his films and in and in this movie you know really like um, I just, I find them so interesting. And I know that that's a real guy too, you know, cause, cause of where they were filming and just because of the way he acted, I can just kind of tell, I, I don't think he was playing a character. I think he was just being himself. Um, yeah. And it, it, it adds like a sense of realism, uh, to it. Yeah. I, I, I think we, we've already said it and if, but if not, I just want to say it again, the acting, I think all the way through is really good. Um, I don't know if it's a controversial take to say that Werner, I thought acted really well because he seemed pained and he was also really funny. Um, also was the, the other brother who wanted to be Uh a wrestler. Um, yeah, just overall great performances. And I think that kind of shows that, this structure, Dogma 95, because I think Celebration is, is the same way, can really, it, it allows the performers to, to kind of fill some of the void that's created by, you know, we're not going to CG in like anything. It's, it, this is the story. You guys use this as your canvas. And I thought it brought out the best in these actors in, in this film. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And what for me, what it brought out a lot of, and this may just be, you know, from my personal background and growing up, um, luckily I was never in a family like this, but it's just like you see the nuclear family, which, which you know, a lot of Americans would describe as like the, the ultimate goal. Mm-hmm. And then you see that this nuclear family is basically, they're all 
they're all like they it doesn't work like mm-hmm. so like the dad and I had seen this growing up is like all he wants is is for his son the wrestling he doesn't care much about like Werner doesn't care much about um, Julian he cares about his son that can wrestle because he wants him to be the best and win the wrestling tournaments and I found the same thing with a lot of um, parents in terms of football and it was usually because you know they had played football when they were younger they just love football they want their kids to do that and they're like they want them to be a champion and he's kind of saying all these all, all Werner's saying it in these ways like oh i want you to be a champion and, so, and it's <laughs> funny you know it's funny but like he's he's like giving a an american like like dad that like is really like concerned with his kids sports performance which i've seen so much of um, he's like giving his best impression on that. And it's just, it's funny cause it's him, but it's also true. And, and I think, um, one of the best, or one of my favorite scenes is, um, the, the one where, uh, Julian is like saying his poem at the table oh, and it's yeah. like eternity chaos and like, and it's just like nonsensical. And then, and then it's chaos. Like, Everything's it's chaos. <laughs> And then Werner's like, it's too artsy farts for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like it's like the the whole family, like none of them are really connected, you know, personally. That it, it's like you have this this family, but that you know, incest between the brother and the sister, and then mm. the miscarriage at the end, and then like the brother is is schizophrenic, you know, and the dad obviously doesn't know how to deal with that. You know, he's in his room with a shotgun you know, like losing his mind, you know, actually. Mm -hmm. And the dad's just, and Werner's just, you know, not there. So there's just a lot of like interesting, I think, sub, and and I would just say Southern because I've I've seen this kind of stuff myself. Um, Southern type of, or Southern, not South America, but the Southern part of the United States type of culture in this movie. Yeah, it's, it's broken. You know, it's it it's it's almost like it's a critique on Middle America. It's th- this family feels like the most hopeless, like forgotten part of uh, our American culture. And I, I I don't know whether it's talking about maybe the downfall of like how the nuclear family can be so perverted and and so broken or maybe it's just harmony kind of showing what life was like for him and he's just kind of showing what he knows like his experience to us but you you're so right and it's like none of these parts work correctly together um you know the the sister and the the schizophrenic they seem to have like this honest true relationship but it's so perverted by incest and a pregnancy the wrestling son has no like real connection and um even the father like wanted him to dress up in his his wedding gown yeah that's a weird scene that was so weird and yeah, for for Werner to hit both the funny stuff, like you sent me this clip prior to actually watching the full movie, but when he's standing on the glass to pick up the cigarette, and he's like, that you would be a good man. And yeah, then, yeah. <laughs> and then you smoke the cigarette. <laughs> he's like, and then he's like, he's or he thinks he did it, and then he's like, but you have to stand up and smoke it. He's like, I've never smoked. He's like, you'll learn eventually. <laughs> <laughs> you get that side. And then you get like, you said he's in his room. I like, I, I think at one point he's like taking cough syrup or something. And uh, you like, he'll have a gas mask on. You're like, th- like this guy's literally just going out of his gourd right now. Yeah, well, he's having, you know, he's having schizophrenic episodes and it's like there's no one really there to like watch over him. Mm -hmm. And like, and I mean, living, I guess, in Austin, I'll just say there's a quite like our homeless population is quite large. And so I see 
a lot of people like Julian on the street and they're acting cause, cause when they had him on the street and like when they had Chloe going into the shop, that was all, and like the bus on the way back, the miscarriage and all that, that was all hidden camera stuff. So uh, this was all, you know, before people were going out and secretly filming, you know, like prank videos for YouTube. He was going out and secretly filming, you know, Julian acting like a schizophrenic on the street to see how other people would react. And you see that most people don't pay any attention to him. And that's exactly like what happens in real life because most people are kind of put off and by that kind of thing. Um, but when, when, you know, and it's like you want to help those people, but you don't really know how. Mm hmm. Um, because you know, the I I don't know. I don't want to get into like the psychology of schizophrenia and the medicine and how it might not be the most uh productive and how we might not know how to fix or how to like help people with schizophrenia right now more than we could. Um but and I don't really think that's something he's he's trying he's not, not trying to like put this message in the film like we need to put more funds into fixing schizophrenia or anything like that um but i think it's it's just you know i think it's him like you said i, I really think it's him exploring a personal part of his life he grew up in nashville mm. um and gummo if you watch that is a lot more about the kids he grew up with and you see how weird his world was i mean he grew up in a commune um, and his parents now live in like the Amazon jungle or something crazy wow. like that. Like his, his, he, he is, his, his upbringing in his family is he kind of doesn't talk a lot about it, but when he does, you realize, you know, he grew up kind of as a crazy kid, you know, mm -hmm. just kind of wild kid. Um, and so he see, he, and he loves all these, he just loves different characters. And I think he wanted to put, some he, he always wants to put something on screen that's never been there before that's what he always says you know a visual that's never been seen and i think what he really just wanted to do was show what the life of a schizophrenic is like kind of through the lens of them and in that way using the dogma style i think was a really good idea to put it through the lens of a sch schizophrenic's eyes um as well as you know capturing in that home video style to make you kind of be like, Oh, this is a real person. You know, you mm -hmm. have that aspect to it also. So it all, it all kind of works for him in this movie, the dog, the dogma stuff in general, um, in portraying what he wants, I think. Yeah. And, and do you think that is what harmony was going for? I guess dual purpose of this kind of really unique filming style or i guess you know the final product of what the film looks like to be make us feel you know almost like more familiar with the characters almost like it's a group of people we've known and also so it's like you kind of get a worldview of someone who is kind of seeing things in a distorted manner yeah i'd say i'd agree with both those things um you know i don't I don't know if he would say that that he did it on purpose, but I think that was definitely in the back of his mind. Um, you know, for both of those things, um, the the you know that might be us reading and saying the distorted war worldview and schizophrenia link up, um, but I really think that that it's it it really is the case. It's just like through the movie, like I, I he's not going to tell us that that's the case but i think that's what the viewer gets from it for the most part you know um because he's he's always very you know about his movies um you know i'm not gonna tell you what it's about you know i mm -hmm. want you to decide um and so and i think that's important because you know if you like i have never personally had anyone with schizophrenia in my family but i'm sure that anyone that has this movie probably means even more to them you know, mm -hmm. so I think that's kind of what he was going for. Um. I must say, uh, before we we kind of go into ratings and final topics, uh, or final thoughts rather, there was a sequence when they were playing bowling, 
and I thought that like the movie like my laptop or whatever was like skipping or something wasn't going right because I there it's like it goes like one frame every five seconds but the audio stays in real time do you remember that scene uh, yeah 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 and that's something he does in gummo too he, he yeah it was um, uh <laughs> it was definitely unique for sure yeah it, it's these he he does these weird um you know montage type things a lot well at least in his earlier things where he'll cut a bunch you know the audio will be different and he'll be cutting he'll either like you said like it like you think it's lagging or mm. he's like cutting to a bunch of pictures that he, that have been taken a lot of the times he'll just give cameras to the actors and say film whatever you want and then so he just i think he really gets a ton of film and then you, you know edits it down but i think he just does stuff like that in the editing process in order to i don't know you know i don't know exactly why he does it but i think a lot of the times it's it's maybe it's a mistake <laughs> maybe uh a lot of the times i think it's t it, it is on purpose though and it's you know at least in in his prior movie in gummo it was t it was like a um a montage style type thing like he was going through different um pictures and like there was audio from other stuff and like voiceovers and stuff like that as different things we were playing but yeah he um he what he describes it as he wants images coming at you in all directions and so he and and i think that's that's kind of how he he does it a lot is with the editing he just he's not gonna admit that but yeah i think the editing plays a huge part um yeah and i think that was probably done on purpose i just don't know why he might have just thought it was cool <laughs> you know and then um i'm not sure if we if we went over the ending but i think it's a probably the the best way to punctuate a film like this and it kind of i don't know i i I'm trying i want to make sure i word this well but it kind of it gives the story a meaning i think it's like th it takes the narrative to a proper conclusion i guess and that is when um chloe sevigny's character pearl falls while ice skating has the miscarriage and then julian takes the baby home and we're kind of just left with him like you know coddling this uh deceased baby in his room under the covers and it just to show how truly affected he was but also th the effect from the emotional trauma and then the effect from the mental illness as well yeah man that part just was really disturbing to me yeah. um like caring like just that whole like concept in general carrying around a mm. a dead baby you know and still thinking it's alive you know that's that's very eerie and he also you know when he was on the bus those were all hidden cameras so all those people thought that was actually happening which is pretty crazy to think about <laughs> um he was getting uh, weird looks but, for sure Oh yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. Put, he put hidden cameras on there, and he was. I mean, he, he's trying to make it as as dogma and real as possible. And he even said about um, about Chloe not actually being pregnant because it was his girlfriend at the time that he was just shooting blanks, and that was just a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but what you said about you know, I don't know if he doesn't think in terms of narrative and story usually, but I agree that that is you know the right type of conclusion for this movie mm -hmm. um you know it's like the movie's pretty disturbing you know we'll say that 100 mm percent -hmm. um but that part in particular the ending is just it kind of comes full circle you know i guess you could say you realize after that that he really kind of is alone because like in the family 
Like, even though a sister does love them, like you said, but they do have a perverted relationship, the dad and the wrestling son aren't really connected to him. And, but now he's really connected to this dead fetus. And it's just like sad and, you know, unnerving. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it is, like you said, just a a good conclusion to, to what this movie had to say. I know you absolutely adored this movie, Matt. Uh, what would you rate it? And then any final thoughts? Well, I instantly gave this one a perfect score. Um, I just remember after watching it, I was like freaking out about how much I liked it. Um, <laughs> uh, so final thoughts. I mean, this is just personal bias. I love movies, like I said, that are like, real kind of mm-hmm. you know mo- like kind of like you don't know if the documentary are real um i love harmony Curran's films pretty much all of i i like all of them um and i love his style and the the way he goes about telling stories and i just the last i guess comment i want to make about this movie is that um it's probably going to be the if you've never seen it it's probably going to be the weirdest and most i don't want to use the word unique but i guess you could movie that you've probably seen in a long time if not ever just because of the way he does things and so i highly recommend to check it out and if you find yourself wanting to turn it off before it ends that's perfectly fine <laughs> <laughs> no i don't i think i th- i don't think you know uh the director's intention was to capture a global audience for this one. <laughs> no, not not at all. It's it's definitely um something that is is really gonna strike people hard one way or another. I mean it's gonna yeah. be something you have an emotional reaction to without a doubt. And I think that's what you there should be more stuff like that. More risks taken. Um doing something different because like we were saying at the beginning, if you keep putting out the, like the sim like similar products, it's kind of, you're, you're going to begin to hate it. If you have steak every day, are you going to love steak after a year? Yeah, right. No, you're not. Yeah. And then this is like when my jaw is dropping in movies, that's usually when I'm giving them a perfect score. And my jaw was dropping like throughout this movie. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, that's like, because I'm just a fan of the, you know, make me feel something that I wouldn't normally feel in my everyday life. You know, I want to get taken away into this magic movie land. And even though it's disturbing, this does it. Movies like this do it for me. Same with the celebration. But yeah. This one I I gave a seven, but I'm with you as far as making it, it made me feel something. I enjoyed it. I watched, you know, the whole thing. I, I, even though it was disturbing, um, I was, I was always interested in where it would go. And I do think that there's, there's barriers to entry here where people will probably look at the, the graininess, um, and, and instantly not want to stick with it you might see like that scene we were describing and, and be turned off by that. I would say though, that I think this has a lot to offer. If you do decide to watch it and, you know, kind of get some, like some of these portrayals I think are kind of unmatched. Like you said, this being the truest form of portraying schizophrenia. I, I would agree with that. And I honestly, I think uh, Bremer's or Bremner's portrayal is, is one of the best acting performances I've seen. Yeah, I, I, I 100% agree with that. Um, you can't really, I mean, I don't know how he got into that state. I know they talked to his uncle a lot, but yeah, hard to beat a performance like that for sure. Um but yeah, 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 definitely um check this out if you're if you're willing to, you know, be disturbed. Be careful who you watch this with because 
just you know be careful who you watch it with <laughs> <laughs> um i would watch it alone first um but yeah you know it, it, it and you can get like like you just said i got a lot from it you know mm. not only does it portray that aspect of schizophrenia in film that i think is like kind of the i don't want to seize the word truest but like most representative of someone with the actual disorder um in terms of them being like this weird you know they're not really developed as 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 a true schizophrenic person likely is they're just kind of seen as like oh he you know hears weird voices and stuff like that you know it's it's not just that you know he's trying to show the depths of of this you know i don't know disability so, mm. yeah very very interesting shocking provoking um disturbing but yeah i would definitely give it a shot if you want to try something different it's nice definitely very yeah. very memorable as well yes extremely memorable um without even needing to watch it like more than once or twice <laughs> yeah going into the celebration uh, this is the first dogma film. This is kind of a proof of concept that dogma could be a way to, to – you aren't hindered from being able to tell a story. And I think this story was was told very, very well. And it is the celebration of the patriarch of this family's uh, 60th birthday. And – the son christian is kind of the the guy in the family who has his shit together the most out of his brother and his sister he is a twin and his twin recently died i am not sure if they i think they did let you know pretty early on that it was via suicide and yeah. during his speech or toast, he drops a huge uh, bomb at the wedding and tells this room full of people that he was molested by his father. And it just yeah. all devolves from there. And then we eventually kind of get to a resolution. And I think... We'll talk about it a little bit, and then we'll go into spoiler territory. But uh, what were your initial thoughts on this one, Matt? Well, you kind of already spoiled uh. it. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of the crux, in my opinion. But and that's fine, you know, because that is... You need that for the description of the movie. Yeah. Um, but you don't, uh, you don't... I will say, you don't quite know whether it's true or not. Yeah, until yeah, a certain yeah. point. You know. Yeah, yeah, that that's true. Yeah. Um, wait, so sorry, what was the initial question? <laughs> what well like what was just your your kind of initial thoughts after you watched this one? Oh, man, I was like this was another one that took me on like an emotional journey, I guess, or roller coaster. Um like my thoughts were just like wow, <laughs> you know, holy and, you know, holy crap, um, because, you know, it's like, so the way it starts, you, you like, I went in blind, you know, I didn't know what the reveal was or anything like that. And when he says that, um, it's just so disturbing. And I, I think I heard you mention on other podcasts, you love true crime, mm. that, right? Yes. So I do, I do too. So. I'm familiar with a lot of cases, you know, and a lot of like cases where stuff like this happens, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not that, un I mean, it's not common, but it's not that uncommon either. Um, and just the way he describes what happened to them um, is horrible. But the, the intro of the movie you can already feel tension build. At least I can already feel tension building. Just with that brother, he seems like a loose cannon right off the bat. I forget his name, and he ends up being a huge loose cannon. Not yes. Christian, but uh, the other Michael. guy. Michael. 
you know yeah, yeah. michael and, and he, he seems like like so you're going into it and you're like okay this is a really really rich family right like mm -hmm. really rich and like like the brother like the unhinged brother i'll just call him the unhinged brother is like freaking out about not having the right clothes like he can't wear like brown shoes or something <laughs> the way. you know stuff like that um and you're like wow these people are like very uptight and like so that's kind of what you got going in and then so you know that everyone everyone there's kind of like you know having small chat it's like that I've never really been to one of these types of celebrations, but these just, it would be called like a bourgeois, you know, a very mm -hmm. upper class, uh, would you call it a black tie event or something like that yeah. to celebrate this, obviously this man who could, who you would assume to be maybe a CEO of a big company or something like that, who, I mean, I, I think they own that hotel. Um, mm -hmm. That's like part of their family business. But, um, yeah, you go in and you're like, okay, so it's a rich family. And then when that bomb drops, so I know that, that none of, except the leads, no one in the crowd knew. And I think I told you this already that, um, that he was going to say that because he was trying to capture, you know, actual reactions from the people there, uh, with the, with using like, you know, dogma, he was trying to, to not tell certain people things, tell other actors things that other actors didn't know to try and create like a, like real drama on the set mm. that he could film. Um, you know, but it wasn't in like a mean spirited way. He was just trying to create the story. And I think he was trying to do it. And it interesting. And it's, and it's cool to me. Like you see the different groups, like the kitchen staff, and all these people all react kind of differently to at least the initial bomb drop that or speech that Christian gives at the table. Um, and it's funny that, or it's not really funny. It's disheartening, honestly, that the first time he says it, no one really does anything. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What'd you think about that? I thought it like, I think you hit the nail on the head that it came off. If you like really kind of were to think of how a situation like that would go, I kind of think that is how it would go. Yeah. It's, no, yeah, I agree, actually, especially with a family like that. Yeah. They're going to be hush hush, you know, which and, and to put if you like were to put yourself in the shoes of someone telling or saying that because I think you would just immediately imagine like a huge weight off your shoulders and that like you it would set you free but it's almost like this movie is kind of like okay the battle begins now it's like now you have a long journey before this kind of meets the resolution that you might have expected at the very beginning right yeah and this is like it touches on such a true thing that at least i've seen watching you know like i said true crime and other stuff like that where like if it's a parent and and if it's like a parent molestation involved or even any sort of relative usually people don't talk about it a lot of times because this exact thing and i think you're exactly right in the way that you said that they would react like this because you know first of all people aren't going to believe it on first you know mm -hmm. they're, they're going to question it first off um they're going to be like why didn't you say something when you were younger that's the other thing they're going to say mm -hmm. um but really it seems like for you know real people and him in the movie and you know i guess his sister who committed suicide as well it had just been festering and boiling up and they, I guess they just felt like they couldn't talk about it or tell anyone, probably because they had these ideas, like you said, like they, they know that if they do that, the road is just beginning to like maybe a collapse of family relations entirely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he probably still, you know, I, I, this didn't happen to me, thankfully, but like 
he probably still loves his dad, you know, and he's looking right as right at him when he says it. And even though he's done horrible things, so he probably still, you know, it's his dad, you know. So it's such yeah. a hard thing to say in front of that group of people. But I totally like it was definitely him trying to get that relief off his off his back. And right as he does, you know, it's like, oh crap, what did I just do? You know, mm -hmm. um, even though like the initial reaction from the people isn't like everyone freaking out and he's getting thrown out. That kind of happens later. Um, but it's more just him kind of saying what he's been wanting to say for like 20 or 30 years, you know, um, that he just hasn't been able to. And I think that the, it, it, the movie kind of just says kind of implies that the suicide was like the final nail in the coffin for him. Yeah. You know, in terms of coming out with this kind of information. Um, I think he kind of saw that he was going to take that same direction if he didn't kind of do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or it just, you know, a lot of the times, like, like you just said, you know, it perpetrates, you know, like they'll want them. I don't know why, but like people who get molested often do it to other people more. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that was part of the reason why he said it. But I mean, another great acting performance is by Christian because like he seems like the way he looks like the whole movie is just like he has that like kind of rage, I guess. I don't know if that's the right word, boiling up inside of him, like mm -hmm. that urge to just spill out um, you know, what what happened. And then when he does it and at first and it's not like no one cares, but they basically throw start throwing him out, trying to keep him out. You know, he starts getting mad, you know, and it's just it's getting worse for him. Um, but but yeah, it's it's such a like that stuff's such a touchy subject, and then to bring it up in front of the whole family and all, all their friends is is also like you've got to have. Got to have some freaking like. Well, I don't want. I, I don't. You just got to be. I don't know. Very confident, I would say, mm -hmm. and 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 knowing what's gonna come if you're gonna do something like that, you know. Yeah. Um. And you know, it's 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 kind of surprising that he was originally just he was just going to say it, and he's like, I mean, they know now, and then leave. But then his childhood friend who works in the kitchen kind of spurred him on to yeah. see it all the way through. He's like, you know, that's not – it's not doing anything. No one – people probably didn't even really catch it, especially with the way they acted. And then it's like that's when the work begins and it becomes like the most – I mean, he has to really like work to kind of see this to fruition. Yeah, it, it's maybe it's like a, I don't know, I just thought of this like a analogy to how, you know, when, when victims speak up, they're not mm. usually heard or believed the first time. Mm -hmm. And that, and like, what does he get thrown out? Like two times, two or three <laughs> I times. I think so. Yeah. You know, be before they finally start to believe him, it's like, and, and then I'm, and I'm not, we could talk about the, the final thing, reason everyone really believes him at the end, you know, the note that the sister reads, but, um, but yeah, it's like, he came in with this, monkey on his back and he wanted you know to get it off and then he tries to get it off no one's listening to him or believing him and the only other person that knew besides the dad well and the mom is the sister who has passed away so mm -hmm. he doesn't have anyone to like back up his story you know so the dad could just say he doesn't but he could just say or maybe he does kind of say that didn't happen um and people are just going to believe him, you know, and that's a true in 
the real world in a lot of these situations and in the film, you know. And then, you know, like after the just the first speech, the dad, I, I saw it as he was kind of exerting pressure on him to fold. He's like, you made a very serious accusation. He's like, I don't recall that. He's like, we need to have yeah. the, the cops here if that's what really happened. And I think he was like almost kind of threatening him. He's like, look, you if you say this stuff, I'm like, your life is going to be uh, like, are you like, you're, you're nuts. Like, how could you think that happened? And like, no one's going to believe you type deal, which I think goes deeper into kind of the metaphor you were talking of, of what people like what victims often run into in these types of situations. Yeah, exactly. Like when you're going against, you know, we don't know what he does, but he's a powerful man. That's how he's portrayed in the film. Mm -hmm. When you're going up against a powerful guy and he comes, he's going to come to you one-on-one -on -one and say something like that. Most likely, you know, like that's a totally like typical thing. Like even if, even though Christian was right, he's going to be like, why are you talking about this? Like, like, like they kind of had this, like maybe implied thing between each other after it had happened and Christian had grown up that they would, that he would never speak of it. You know, it was just mm -hmm. kind of me. They probably had a weird relationship um, where they just acted like it never happened. And so, and so now, you know, he's going to be like, what do you, you're the crazy one, you know? And, and and so who who are they going to believe? You know, the dad who they're all there to celebrate, or Christian, who seems at first just like he's, you know, he, I I believed him, but like, um, you know, he just seems. Uh, it's hard to gra It's hard to exactly um, pinpoint what his emotion is because kind of goes back and forth between. Um, you know, seeming upset and um, and and seeming like hesitant, and then um, I, I I don't know. He gets a very good performance where it's just he he seems like he has a lot of emotions inside of him, like someone mm -hmm. that actually was a victim would, especially with their father confronting their father there. This whole situation, you know, think about if that if you were at a family dinner party. I get to if, if I ever went to a family event like I do sometimes and we were all having dinner and and or at a wedding, you know, and someone gives that as their like token. Oh my god. You know? Like like, oh my God, you'd be like, Oh my gosh, this is not gonna be good. You know, and then you know, so it's just it it, it creates a crazy situation for the whole group, but but Christian knows this is the time he needs to do it, you know? Mm. And uh, I honestly, I, I feel like ki kind of the nonchalant nature of how he said it the first time is like what is like, I think why people are like able to almost act like, did I like, did I hear that? Like, what, what do you say? And yeah where you're you're almost questioning like and then as he kind of gets more emotional i think maybe on like the second or third time he comes back to address the father it's like that's when his conviction started to really convince me of what really did happen and uh did you find it at all uh I, I guess not weird because I think it is accurate as far as happening in real life, but that the mom not only knew, but defended and attacked. She defended his, her husband and kind of attacked her son later. Yeah. I mean, in terms of like real things that happens all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, the, the mom that, uh, I don't know if I can say this, uh, cause it was something that I experienced in like, uh, real life, but, um, well, not personally, just, I saw a case, but like I've read, we'll say I've read about cases where like 
you know, the mom has a boy, new boyfriend and the boyfriend's molesting her daughter, you know, stuff like that. Um, and they'll side with the boyfriend. And, yeah. And, and well, it's not just that they just kind of turn a blind eye and I don't, I can't really explain why I have no idea why they do that. You know, I don't have kids, but I, I, I mean, I plan to eventually. And when I do, you know, I, in my mind, that seems like it makes absolutely no sense. Mm-hmm. But, but so I, I, I don't know, you know, um, about the mom. Um, maybe she, I don't, I, that's such a hard thing to get into. Maybe she feels trapped by the husband. Um, but, but these, these kind of things happen. And it's just there, there's not much of a rational explanation for people, especially for people that literally see it happening and and um don't do anything about it and uh one just quick comment um i actually the initial announcement kind of like you were saying i kind of was like did he get molested because he just talks about them in the bath and stuff Mm. and the way he kind of phrases it is sort of like a poem in a way a little bit like talks about the different like uh seasons and he's like every season there were baths and and all this stuff and i was like wait does that mean that they're all taking baths together you know it's like this yeah. weird you know so you're kind of like what but then but then as you were saying when he starts coming in more and more stuff starts getting unveiled more and more you know yeah um and you're right yeah the way he did say it was like a little weird and it, you kind of had to like think like what what he was trying to say there, and then it becomes more and more clear. Um, a few points I want to make because I wanted to see kind of if you felt similarly or what your perspective was. But I I don't know. To me, and on a personal level, uh, despite how despicable the father was, I kind of disliked the mother more. I guess for her actions and just the way she was personality wise. And I will say in a weird way, and I don't know if you felt this at all, but there was honestly times where even as it is clear, I began to kind of sympathize with the father. Did you feel that at all? In a weird way, at the end i did even though i felt like it was a really perfect ending um just because like i mean (laughs) it's such a hard thing to talk about because he did horrible things so sympathizing with him is hard and and like they just all there he just you know his world just came crashing down and you see a broken man at the end and i think that's when the sympathy comes in you know when they're just basically like i thought they killed him at the end but it turns out they didn't they just you know beat the the effing crab out of him um and then they just kind of are like yeah we're not gonna have breakfast with you you know when Mm -hmm. in in that scene the very final one i'm kind of just like damn like he just pretty much lost his kids you know yeah but he also like he also you know for life he has scarred them yeah especially christian and and i mean the other one that passed away you know um and and how do you come back from that from on either side really i I feel like it's something that's gonna have the ultimate effect on all parties yeah no yeah i know and it's like it, it, no one wins mm. in that situation at all, but but it's not like he shouldn't have said it, you know? Like, it had to be said. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, he... Like, it, or else this kind of stuff just keeps getting shoved under the rug. Um, and I think it's it's an interesting for me is is I've seen, you know, all different classes of people growing up. And that really, really upper class type of family is so much more hush hush. And just in my personal experience, not trying to generalize, mm-hmm. um, 
than, you know, a poor family where it's likely kind of come out because they're, they're more, you know, they might be more aggressive or they're going to get police called on them. Things mm-hmm. like that. Whereas this family, the police are going to show up. Oh, everything's fine. You know, as they're maybe in the bath, he just gets out. Everything's fine. And the mm-hmm. cops believe him because they're this, you know, he's the CEO of Amazon or whatever, you know, uh, the cops they're they're not going to bat an eye and they're going to be like, okay, where is it? They, go into this house and it, you know, just looks like, you know, uh, bad. It just kind of feels bad and bad vibes and you and maybe a domestic violence incident. And they start investigating that and that uncovers, you know, um, you know, molestation accusations and things like that. Where in this case, there's just never going to be not only no police probe into this thing, but, there would never have been a family probe at all unless Christian would have spoken up. And this would have always been something that Christian lived with and never told his brother or his older sister who were still living. And I think that would be dying at the grave, knowing that your father did those things and not telling your family, I think is worse than, telling them just because like like how can you live with that i i don't Mm -hmm. know you know i'm not i like i said i've never been through it i don't know how to explain it because i haven't been through it but to me it's something that would be so hard to live with and not talk about because there's so many things you just want to get off your back you know or off your chest when you when they're bubbling up inside you Mm -hmm. and i just can't imagine something like this your own dad you know like how much you'd want to talk to someone about that you know yeah i'm right there with you because there's been stuff on a scale that really doesn't compare to that but you know if i feel like if i can't verbalize it that it just really bubbling it bubbles up and, and bottling it up just it makes me feel just like I'm bursting at the seams, you know? So I, I feel like, honestly, it was something where he he didn't even, he didn't want to live with it anymore. And even just that knowledge, because he, he seems to want to join his sister. And it's like, I don't know if dream sequence would be the right way to describe it, but he passes out, he sees his sister and, and, he wants to rejoin her and whether that's just because he misses her so much or if it's because kind of life has been very much fractured. But, um, you know, there is, I think a happiness to where he's able to finally, it seems like live a normal life. Like he asks out the waitress and I think we kind of get somewhat, uh, positive character arcs for the brother and the sister as well yeah yeah we do which is interesting because i thought the brother was going to continue being a total you know piece of crap the whole movie i didn't like him (laughs) um for several reasons one of the scenes that disturbed me the most was from him started by him um and and you do see his a character arc from him, which is crazy at the end. And I didn't even expect that. And, you know, you do see Christian with the waitress. You know, he's it's kind of like he's like maybe a little more comfortable with himself now that he got all that off his chest. Mm-hmm. He had been kind of flirting with that rate waitress the whole time. But, you know, at the end, he finally is like, you know, will you come back to I forget where he lives, France or whatever with me or Paris or whatever. And she's like, yeah, you know, so it's kind of a happy resolution for everyone except the father who we already talked about is just kind of broken Mm -hmm. at the end you know what does he have now they were all there to celebrate him and it ended up being the opposite of a celebration essentially yeah and i i do i think this movie makes um really valid points and you know it resonates now especially um 
it's kind kind of a side tangent on it, but I think it plays into the same point that I'm going to try to make. But Michael uh, had, I, I think it had to have been timeline-wise, an affair with another one of the waitresses and uh-huh. was kind of able to just brush it aside. And I think that is kind of feeding into one of the messages, which is that rich fame power allows you to kind of go through life in a way that almost like in a invincible manner and you really don't have to deal with things in like a normal human way like we have to deal with like if we did that it would show up like you were saying a poor family something like this would come to the surface and you'd have to deal with it. But the, the father and the son kind of have been able to just get away with their indiscretion and and kind of the sins of their past. But in the ending, it kind of shows that, look, these Titans can like, they're mortal too. And that you just because you are rich, famous, powerful, does not mean you are truly invincible and that there are repercussions no matter who you are. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that this kind of stuff has now been happening in the Mm -hmm. real world, like 20 years after this movie. Yeah. Do you know, like with the Weinstein bill, you know, caused all this, all these people, victims are finally coming out kind of like Christian and, and, you know, giving their stories and, and it's, it's, it's just interesting that, uh, you know, it's like two decades later, we have this real life movement where people are trying to come out against actual powerful people and expose them for these types of injustices they're doing to others. I mean, they may not be their children, but all the same, they're still getting harmed in terrible ways. Mm -hmm. And, um, it like almost their their dinner table it it almost makes it look like you're in a jury room a little bit which is yeah. kind of like an odd a nice little twist that I, I i like i don't know whether that was intentional or maybe that's just where your mind goes in a situation like this yeah i like for me the house itself in the movie like turns into this like celebration place to like a horror house and where they take their keys they can't leave it's like they're stuck there it's like uh, it's like it's turned into this awful horrible party where they're not even celebrating anymore everyone's just like losing their minds you know because by the end the 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 crazy brothers just beating the everyone crap out of like tons of different people i keep like like that mistress you mentioned he or the brother really invokes what you know this is my you know because what he says to her um at the end and i thought he killed her too but i guess he didn't is like don't he's like don't f with my family or something like that you know so they have he has so much pride in like him being from a powerful family and he thinks he can use that and he just thinks the waitress is you know beneath him um, yeah you know, uh, and so he really, I think, evokes that uh, even though he, ironically, he is kind of seen, I'd say, by the family as the lowest on the totem pole. Like, he's not quite doing the best, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of, like, his finances and his life. But he still evokes that uh, pretentious, I'm from, my 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 dad is so-and-so kind mm-hmm. of person. You know, like, that's what he would tell people. Um but yeah, uh, and I wanted to ask you, you know, this might not be in line with where you were going, but about the boyfriend that gets introduced and the scene, which I was saying earlier was one of the hardest scenes for me to watch because I thought it was just, uh, you know, just horrible where they're all where the brother starts that racist chant. Oh yeah, with, with the African, she has the African American boyfriend. He immediately comes out and calls him Charlie Brown, and I'm just like, oh boy, <laughs> here we go. You know, this guy's going to be a really racist dude, and yeah. yeah, that's what it ends up being. You know, so so it's like 
they're really making him a, a very dislikable character. Um, and then, you know, and, and what I was saying about it turning into a horror house was like, by the end, it felt like a thriller to me. Like I was like, Oh my God, are these like, is the boyfriend like literally about to go really go at it with the brother? And like, someone's going to die here. I think, yeah. you know, like, like those are the kinds of thoughts I was having. Like, it's just this explosion that's happening on on screen by the end. Yeah, the the emotion that they're able to do, kind of go through was super awesome. I know I had said, I think while we were talking about Julian Donkey Boy, but I thought the acting in this was really cool, and I think it should be mentioned too that the cinematography, I think it was a very good kind of uh proof of concept using these handhelds can actually allow you to get shots that might not be as easy to get if you were you know using one of those big studio cameras on a you know you i think it worked out very well with this film and everything as far as the dogma rules kind of played into the advantage of this movie and and it really really came off really well i thought yeah i totally agree i think that the fact that you know looks kind of like a it looks kind of like they hired a camera crew maybe to come film their dad's 60th or something you Mm -hmm. know like like that's the vibe i get from it like it's like this um you know we're gonna have these people come in and just film the event you know um and, and and that's what I think adds to, or, or that's how I think the dogma plays into it is you get that realistic kind of aspect from it. Also, what you mentioned, I think a while ago was how, um, because we see these people in this home video style, you know, do we see them more like us? And I think that answer is yes, mm-hmm. because, you know, when you're watching, you know, you're, family picture or you're seeing family pictures of videos they kind of all look like this yeah uh, at yeah. least maybe for people around our age um you know those older video cameras and pictures um and and so it feels more real and and also another thing i loved is how since it's only handheld cameras i just love i love the the way what they can do with the handheld cameras to where you could still see it shaky, but it's not shaky enough to make you nauseous. And they can move so close into the act, like so close up to the actors Mm -hmm. and, and to, to where the camera itself kind of becomes a character, you know, it's like moving, they're moving in and out of these different scenes, getting very close to people. They can, I, I I think I heard in Vinterberg interview, he was talking about how, you know, how much more freedom he felt with a handheld camera as opposed to, like you were saying, like something on a tripod because he could be, get so intimate with the actors and have the camera become so intimate with the film overall. Like that, that's such an intimate aspect of the or uh, such an important aspect in the film is how intimate the camera gets with its subjects, which also I think, you know, the fact that it's so intimate with its subjects just portrays the emotion even more. I feel the emotion even more. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, I, and again, I like, there was some shots where I, I, I completely agree at that ability to get so cl- close to the actors. Like, I think Christian was walking back to the um, dining room and they were able to do like a really kind of cool sequence where it almost seemed like the camera was like on his hip looking up towards him. And then it would kind of cut, change perspective as he went through doors. And like that was just as far as cinematography goes, I thought that was really cool. And I thought it was very very well directed well acted uh i gave this one four and a half stars out of five and i honestly think you know if i if i ever do rewatch this one which i probably will at some point it could 
bump up to a five because there's so much to love about this one. What what would you give this one, Matt? Yeah, I came this I came out of this one kind of like how I came out of Julian Donkey Boy. Um, when I watch like a a movie, I think it's a perfect. I give it a perfect score. Hmm. I get really excited about it. I start looking up all the interviews about it. Um, from the directors and stuff. Um, I absolutely loved it just because, like like I said, like Scorsese has made this comment that's been huge about Mar- Marvel movies being like roller coasters. Mm. You know, if you've heard that. But it, 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 to me, movies like this are a roller coaster in a different sense. Like I get taken for a ride. You know, yeah, and by the end of it, I'm like, whoa, you know, it was like riding a roller coaster, you know, when I come at it, I'm like, dang, you know, it's that, that magical feeling you get walking out of the theater or wherever you're watching it, where you're just like, I just watch, you know, you just, it's just that feeling that you watch something super interesting, different, compelling, something that makes you think, um, you know, and something that is very relevant to the real world. Very mm. relevant. So, I, and I, I completely agree. And I, I think, um, there, there's sometimes a common sentiment that people are like, "I just wish there was something new." And I think looking to the past is where you're going to be able to find that stuff because I, this is a really true example of that this and Julian donkey boy and they might not be for everyone uh you know there might be certain people that could find them inaccessible but i feel like especially with this one that's not i think the majority of people will be able to find the appreciation for this one so if you do I agree. If you're in that camp, I mean, I think this would be a perfect movie for you. I agree. If you're looking for something that, if you've seen a lot of movies, or even if you haven't, and you're looking for something different, and you don't mind a disturbing story, then please, please watch this movie. (laughs) Because I just think... um, you know, if you want to, even even if you don't want to be a filmmaker, um, you know, it's going to leave a mark on you and you're not going to forget this film. Um, because like you said, it's this whole dogma thing is just so different than really any other, like, I, I don't know of any other movements like this in film. Um, Me neither. I mean, uh, like I, I I don't at all, and this is just such a unique thing that um, like it it can't be copied. So there's not other movies like it, really, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, if if you're willing to to dive into, if you're really wanting to get in more into movies, just to the audience, I guess, uh, you know, give this one a shot. And I think you'll enjoy it, honestly. This one, more than Julian Donkey Boy, a little less access- accessible. This one, I'd say, way more accessible. Still be careful who you watch it with, just because the subject matter, I would say. But um, but overall, like, it's, uh, it's, it's great. And, um, you know, it, it's a, I think it's an essential watch for anyone who who's getting into film or who really wants to, to see all the, all all the different types of films that they can, you know? Absolutely. Uh, Do you have any final thoughts on dogma as a whole? And I guess if you would that ever be kind of a tempting thing for you, if you, if you wanted to make a movie or you wanted to make multiple movies, do you feel like, you would ever be tempted to try dogma? Um, absolutely. Um, I'm just gonna, I'll just go ahead and say like a couple weeks ago, I bought a Lumix GH one Panasonic Lumix GH one. And that's actually a, a, an older camera from like 2008. It was like one of their first 
cameras they released that had video. And um, so the video quality is pretty much worse than an iPhone. But I've been taking a lot of videos and pictures on it recently, just experimenting. You know, I don't really know what I'm doing. But, you know, for someone like me who doesn't really know what they're doing or an ins- someone who wants to make a film, um, I think dogma is incredibly alluring because you don't have to, like, it, it's like, hey, you'll need to work with a bunch of stuff. You know, let's let's make it simpler. And by making it simpler for someone with less of a budget, which is pretty much everybody that's wanting to get into movies unless Mm -hmm. you know you just happen to have a lot of money in your family um movies are so expensive that i mean i mean anything more than a camera like when you start getting mics involved which are required for like a a high a a really a movie that's gonna sound great and look great and everything it's gonna be thousands and thousands of dollars a dog would move me you could probably make a good dogma movie if you're very creative for a few hundred bucks um but what i was saying about the camera is just that like you know that like like i bought that camera to kind of limit myself in the same way that the dogma ways do well also because i don't have a lot of money but um but you know getting getting the grasp of the basics which I think dogma is, it's the, it's core filmmaking. It's just filmmaking. It's, you know, screw the, the editing, the music, post-production, the props, the setting. Let's just, you know, let's just set it all up and everything will just be, will, will just take place as, as it happens on the film, you know, because they say, you know, no extra props, no, crediting the director everything has to be legitimate um things like that it just it makes it way easier i think for aspiring filmmakers to actually make something you know if they maybe try and follow the rules and um you know limit themselves and they have a really good idea um i think yeah i I, it's very inspirational for me um and, and i think it's it's uh it'd be ins- very inspirational for other filmmakers who who want to start making films because you see that and you're like i can buy this and i looked up like the cameras they use to make the celebration they're like 30 dollars on ebay you know oh wow like like they're those those little dvd cams like that they you know that came out in the 90s like that uh yeah they're like 30 bucks now um you know, so you can really make something like this for cheap. Um, so it's just, yeah, in that way, it's very inspirational. And just the way they're able to craft such great stories through such limited technology. I, I, I love that kind of stuff. So, yeah. But that's awesome, man. That's a, that is cool that uh, you were able to to get a camera and that you have started you know filming and stuff and i i think it was a perfect week to have dogma week from that perspective um just because i i feel like you said this i'm kind of surprised it's not an entry point for a lot of new directors you know hello yep up oh, do you hear me Oh yeah, you cut. You have to cut out. I did, yeah, I just heard you say it's a lot of entry point for, and then. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. About uh, that. So I didn't hear you. It's I uh, I'm surprised more directors don't start out with like dogma because of what you said as far as budget limitations and everything. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, I don't know. It might just be. I mean, it it. it it probably it looks way easier than it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. Like it's 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 definitely very hard to do. I remember even um in the Vinterberg interview I watched, he said he watched the final product and he thought he failed. And I mean, he won the Con Jury Prize that year. Hmm. If you know what that is, like the Cannes Film Festival, the the Jury Prize, like one of the, the best oh, prizes okay. you can win. Um. And in my opinion, that's the most important film festival. I mean. So people loved it and he thought it was terrible, you know? So, but yeah. And so I think it's, it's harder than it looks. Um, But 
I think if you're creative and you really have an idea and you're passionate about it, um, yeah, I think this is a perfect way to get started. And you don't even have to strictly limit yourself. They all break the dogma rules. All of them mm. do. And every that's part of like the funny aspect of it. So you can break them, but when you're limit, if you just set that as your limitation, as a starting, as a basis, um, you realize that you, you you can go far, you know, with a small budget, and and I and I love that. Exactly. Hey, well, Matt, I think it was another great episode. I thank you yeah. very much for coming on, man. It's always a pleasure. And Matt is on letterboxd as war champ which i will i'll link to his letterbox you can search it in the search bar as war champ as well but i think it'll be easier to to find in the description so like this video subscribe also go follow matt and um you know we're going to be working on something for the future and hopefully you know we'll have more details to go over because i think you guys are going to be really excited about uh, our future collaboration. So thank you, Matthew. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I love being on this podcast. It's a lot of fun. I love talking movies. Um, you know, follow me. If you want to talk movies, you can comment on my reviews. I'll follow you back. Comment on your reviews. I, I just, I just love discussing film. So yeah. Um, and again, thanks for having me on. It's been great. So. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you all for, for watching this one. We'll catch you on down the line. Bye, y'all. All right. Sounds good. See you.